So uh, we're going to start by singing "Be Thou My Vision," and uh, this is just a good, a good thing for us as we as we come to this Father's Day and consider the goodness of God. Let's sing this.
service, but uh, appreciate the fact that she did that. So we're um, just wanting to take a moment briefly to look at our opportunities and announcements as we have them. Uh, as we have them ahead, you uh, can notice that it's well, actually you don't notice because you don't have it in front of you. Um, young adults aren't resuming this week again. Uh, please continue to to uh, wait for notice from that later on regarding that. Um, the family prayer meeting is taking place this week at the church. John Burks is going to be leading that. Uh, and again, Thursday and Friday, we have the SAI girls meeting at our home at 7 o'clock and uh, SAI guys meeting at our home at 7 o'clock on the Friday. Um, so with this, again, I'm going to be contacting you. Please get in contact with me and uh, make sure that you let me know that you can attend. We're working to maintain that group of 10 size as we're required to. And so uh, we have to... I, I don't like to be a hard mind about this, but we probably need to cut off just to make sure that we're kind of getting within the realm of what's expected of us. So, so please be aware of that, girls and guys, as far as SAI is concerned. Uh, prayers and praise, if you can make note of those. Youth of the Week is Keegan Redekop. Uh, Family of the Week, uh, let's be praying for Dwight Davis. Um, and as you take a look at the matters that are mentioned, so, Pray for our government and the political process that wise and godly leaders will be given a place in the leadership of our country so that we might be able to live peaceful and godly lives in this present age. Uh, as much as we are, uh, I'm not inclined to try and use this as a, as a kind of a pulpit from which I push things. We do want to be thinking very carefully inside of the a God honoring view of the world and the view of our nation about the leadership that we that we choose and uh, if we have the opportunity to participate in that choosing then we want to make sure that what we do is uh, make a decision or choice that is wise to the glory and honor of God. Uh, the Conservatives of course had leadership debates this past week um, and I don't know if you're aware of them or the candidates but be informed. Take time, be informed and think. Um, pray for Dorothy McMaster as she undergoes a follow-up surgery to deal with a vascular blockage in her arm. Uh, I don't know that it's taking place yet. It was to be either yesterday or today, depending on when they had uh, beds open. Uh, she's recovering well from the heart procedure, but uh, she did end up having, having uh, vessels that blocked and as a result of that they were going to have to open things up. She was dealing with quite a bit of pain in her arm in response to the procedure. Um, pray for our teens and children as we officially come to the end of the school year that their summers will be used for good purposes and be God honored. Pray for our older teens as they work through future plans in light of the present. And uh, I, uh, if, if you're someone who is coming to the end of high school, there, of course, has been disruption in the process and, and even questions as to what's taking place next fall. And uh, we, we pray for them as they try and figure things out. We pray that they won't experience an enormous amount of frustration um, and that they will use their time well uh, as, they, as they prepare, as they move forward with their future. Um, just one other thing that I'm going to mention, it's not really an announcement, but uh, the, the uh, Bible reading plan, I hope that each of you has your own copy of the Bible, Bible reading plan, and if you don't have a, a hard copy of it, uh, you might have uh, at least access to it electronically. Uh, Marcy puts that, that Bible reading plan out every week. And one of the things that I have felt has been kind of underlined for me during the past number of months is the absolute necessity in a world that is increasingly demonstrating its instability and destabilization, the absolute importance of being immersed in solid, objective truth. And so I would encourage you, even if you haven't been participating in the Bible reading plan, to really make sure that you become someone who is regularly spending time in truth and in the stability of truth. It is such a good thing. Uh, and 
it is such a healthy thing for us spiritually. Um, this week, uh, reading in Proverbs, spending time going through Proverbs, I'll tell you, Proverbs are kind of a combination of what you would call uh, instruction, as far as command sort of thing, and observation. And so it's not observational humor, but observation on the human condition and on what people are like and what the world is like around you. And if you've been reading those Proverbs, wow. <laughs> they may have been given to a man 3,000 years ago, but boy, do they hit it out of the park as far as the nature of our society and people and everything else today and how we have to live wisely in this present age. So let me just encourage you to be someone who's staying anchored in the Word. It's a really, really important thing. So I just need to come to this. Let's come together before the Lord in prayer. Well, God, as we join together and worship you this morning, we thank you that you are our Father, Lord, that you are a good Father. We thank you, Lord, that we have the blessing and privilege of being your children and also being fathers. So we ask that you give us wisdom, give us courage, Lord. We ask that you be with us this morning. Be with us this day and everything we do and say be according to your will, to your glory. In Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2 reads this. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Okay, we are going to sing, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? And even though you're only supposed to be humming, I'm going to encourage you to stand and hum standing. Okay, so let's sing together.
Well, kids, this time is for you. And we want you to understand that even though we're not having Sunday school or children's church, that we want to include you in our time of worship together. So hopefully you enjoyed the songs humming along. Hey, so how many of you actually started to sing a couple times? When? Me too. You know, they, they start and you just automatically want to sing along. And you go, oh, yeah, can't do that. Just have to hum. Anyways, hope you enjoyed the music. But this is your video, all right? And it's David Becomes King. Do you know how long? Like David was going anointed by Samuel. Did you, did you watch my video that I put for you? The answer. Right? Who didn't watch my video? I put up a video for the children who couldn't be here. Did everybody watch the video? You didn't watch? Okay, good. Then I can ask you, you guys. How long between the time Samuel anointed David and he became king? Who knows? Oh. Okay, do you have any trouble with the video? We don't have it. All right, well, all right. Well, I guess we'll just see. I don't know what we're going to do. Anyways, we'll carry on with my question, though. Who knows how long between the time David was anointed and he actually became king? Do you want to take a guess? Take a guess. One year? Five years? I'll give you choices. Five years, 10 years, or 15 years? No guesses? 15. You watched the video, did you? Good job. And you remembered too. Long time. How good are you guys at waiting to get something you want? You're really good? I'll ask your moms. How good are your children are at waiting to get what they want? Not good. Not good, okay. I don't think that was a mother, I think that was a sibling. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, it's hard. Oh, you got it now? Awesome. All right. Well, again, David had to wait a long time. So that's what your story is about. And in your booklets, you have activity sheets that go with it, all right? And hopefully you guys had a chance also. There's also in the back of the package, also something special. I know Mr. Moskovich is where he is. There's also something special for your father's good father's days to do. David is king. David is king. Thank you. Are we good then to go? All right, so hopefully you have a chance to do the extra activity too for your father's for father's day. Just waiting for us. That's because God knows better than us. He knows when it's the right time for things to happen in our lives. And he'll be pretty frustrated just waiting around. 
but God has a plan for us. Remember your words? Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. So kids, next time we're reading a long time for something, think of this lesson about David. Waiting can be hard, but God knows best. So you can go to work in your workbooks and listen at the same time. So interesting when you answered what you said about uh, you know, did you did you find yourself ready to sing along? Uh, when I was talking to the CBC interviewer, I said to him, uh, I, I said he he said, so how are you guys going to be about not about not singing? I said. I said, I think that there will be some disappointment. I said, because we, we are a singing church. Uh, and uh, he said, so what does, what does the music mean to you? I said, this is a chance to joyfully worship. It's a good thing for us. And we really do enjoy the opportunity to, to worship in that way. So, you know, just uh, at the same time, at the same time, we are able to joyfully worship in the light of the goodness of God, even as we listen to and think about uh, the music that we uh, that we sing together in the course of our service. Uh, let's take a moment, we're going to pray, and then we'll begin in God's Word. Father, thank you for allowing us to come to your truth. I ask that you would teach us from it, and I ask that you would help us, particularly if we think of this as Father's Day. I ask that you would help us to uh, be zeroed in on what it means to honor you as men and honor you as fathers. Teach us through your truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, in many culture, corners of our culture today, in many corners of our country today, the wording of the theme text that I am going to speak about would be considered highly controversial. In fact, I'll go further than that. What I'm going to read to you from the scripture in a moment would be branded as offensive by some. And it's definitely not politically correct, according to others. And yet, as we come to this Father's Day, I think that what I'm going to read for you is essential for the health and strength of our families and our children and our society. So I'm going to ask you all to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. And as we turn there, I want to read it for you, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14. This might be a text that you are completely unaware of unless in the course of your reading through scripture you actually tweaked to this in particular. But it says this, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 and 14. It's the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth who are a mess and he's working to straighten them out. And he says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, I would imagine if you're listening closely and you're aware of the society that you live in, you figured out which of those phrases would be considered a particularly controversial phrase among some you know, among some people and in some corners. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Today is Father's Day, and the truth is, no matter what some might want, we can't separate fatherhood from masculinity and from maleness. Proponents of gender theory might hope otherwise. They might declare otherwise, and they might try and indoctrinate their kids if they're in the public school system into another way of thinking. But thankfully, blessedly, fatherhood and being a man go together as a good gift. In God's design for humankind and families, even in a broken world. Of course, in a broken world, the meaning of masculinity and manliness can also be distorted. As a result, we hear expressions like hyper-masculinity and comic book masculinity, and of course, the favorite phrase today, toxic masculinity. Along with these terms, if we observe what is going on, we understand that in some corners there is a loud message of what I would call anti-masculinity being broadcast by people who are fearful of or 
just can't react. Amen. So as we come to God's word, the word of the one who created fatherhood and created testosterone and created masculinity and said it is good. Let's understand that. He created fatherhood, created testosterone, and he created masculinity and said it is good. I want to reflect on the present day context that we as followers of Jesus find ourselves in. Through all of history, whenever we read God's word, and whenever the community of faith has read God's word, God's truth has been read and spoken inside of a cultural context. And it has been the measure and the critique of that culture where it is being read or spoken. It confirms what is good. It corrects what is wrong. And here are two kinds of voices that we are hearing today as we think of our context. There are loud voices that seem to consider all masculinity toxic, poisonous, and evil. If you haven't heard those, it's probably because you're inside of your own sheltered little world and you're not reading what's being said on the, in the broader plane. But if you've been reading, if you've been aware, if you have a sense of the world outside of yourself, you know that there are people who consider all masculinity toxic, poisonous, and evil. Their song is kind of the opposite of the song that Professor Henry Higgins sings in My Fair Lady, for those of you who might have ever seen that movie. He sings there, why can't a woman be more like a man? And of course, that's supposed to be comical, and it is kind of a silly song that he's singing. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Today, the all masculinity is toxic crowd are singing, why can't a man be more like a woman? That's basically what they're saying. Why can't a man be more like a woman? Their thought is that the masculine is essentially violent and destructive, and that all traditional notions of the masculine are toxic. There are people who declare that regularly and loudly, and they're well heard, and it's actually an acceptable statement in many corners. Then there's the other kind of voice. There are the men who view mas whose view of masculinity would allow for and include domestic violence and sexual assault and bullying and self-entitlement and violent domination and the thought that somehow if you're really promiscuous that proves that you're really a man. In other words, there are men whose view of masculinity is warped and toxic. There is that in our culture and in our society. But God created man and manliness, and it was good. And I'm talking about this today not only for you dads, but I'm also talking about to dads and moms for your boys and for other boys. This is an important thing. Because if the approved cultural message that condemns the masculine gets louder so that boys are confused about masculinity and are told that good masculinity doesn't exist, the result will be a masculinity vacuum, vacuum and a morally impoverished society into which bad things grow. Because vacuums don't stay vacuums. Something seeks to fill them. Boys have a desire and a drive to become men. And if masculinity is consistently torn down, who will define how they will fulfill that drive? For example, social observers will tell you that among the fatherless boys of the inner cities, gangs have often filled the role of defining what manliness looks like. At least part of the mess that we are seeing in the cultural context of the United States in particular today, and to a lesser degree, inside of Canada, but still present in the inner cities, is we are seeing fatherless young men who are trying to figure out what manliness is and are having it defined by peers who have already chosen violence and destruction. 
there will be a vacuum created if we destroy true and good masculinity, and into that vacuum will come a perverse and destructive form of it. And it's not only for boys that this is important. Girls want the love and protection and security of a good man. This is the reality of it. Girls want the love and protection and security of a good man. And it starts with your dad. That's where it starts. But after that, the question you have to ask is, will someone fill that space in their hearts? Or will their hearts be trampled on and trashed by a bad master in the these are things for us to consider. And today I want to take some time and I want to think according to God's design. And here's what I'm going to say right up, off, off, the, off the top as my caveat here. As we're thinking according to God's design, masculinity does not require that you love cars or guns and hunting. It doesn't require that you love sports. You're not required to have big muscles to be masculine. You're not required to be a top of the heap alpha male to be masculine. And it's definitely not required that you like scratching and spitting and belching. None of these things are essential to being masculine. Now, on the interest side, I might have listed some of your interests or inclinations, but none of these are essential to God's design or definition of man. We, fact, we start, in fact, with a true picture. We start with a true ideal as to what masculinity is. Because there is one who demonstrates right masculinity. One who demonstrates what we were designed for. Even when it comes to living out what it means to be a man in a broken world among a bunch of flawed definitions. God became a man. He became a man in the fullest and most complete sense. He had testosterone. He had the fullest, fullness of human form. He wrestled with the struggles that we have to think through as a man. So for instance, Jesus showed us that there is such a thing as a legitimate, justified use of force, which is not something that you often attached to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ showed that there is legitimate, justified use of force. Consider his actions against the money changers in the temple, twice. His answer was yes. There is legitimate, justified use of force. Jesus didn't make that whip out of threads, and he didn't just wave it around like this. He went with force against evil. Now this isn't characteristic of his life, but it was necessary in some instances. And he was prepared to exercise force. Jesus showed us that God-honoring men will protect and show courage and endure hardship and make sacrifices and will speak against wrong. And he did this in both life and death. We see him standing against wrongdoers to protect the oppressed. And then we see him finally on the cross. Jesus Christ corrects any view of manliness also that doesn't include gentleness or tenderness. As we see him continually, repeatedly, showing patience and compassion. So we have a picture of what masculinity in its truest form looks like. We already have our idea in Christ. But I want to take a little bit of time today and look further into Scripture to consider three masculine ideas that were given to encourage us in what the Spirit of God is saying when we read these words. Act like a man. Act like men. So back to our theme text. We read this, verse 13 and 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. And as we start here, understand that the word act is important. 
That word act is very important. Because being a man is far more than just your human form and your chromosomal makeup. Being a man requires taking action. It, required, it requires taking initiative. So we're told to demonstrate what it means to be a man. And the first thing that we read as we take a look at this text is act like a man and show love with strength. Act like a man and show love with strength. Because there is a view of Christianity that makes, that makes Christianity soft and passive and weak. And you know what? Anywhere that that view has prevailed, where Christianity tries to define manhood as soft and passive and weak, men have been chased away. Or they felt in some way that strength must be suppressed, and so they're absent. Tell you what, one of the reasons why the average United Church is empty is because of the fact that their view of Christianity is not manhood. So why in the world would you show up? As a man, you would take a look and say, do I really want to be a part of that? <laughs> and I'm being blunt. And I know that there are United Churches that do not fall into that camp. But that is the case in most of the liberal denominations where your definition of Christianity is not manly, doesn't include and encourage the masculine, there is an outcome. And that is that men don't show up. This is the reality of it. We even have a misunderstanding inside of Christianity of words like meek. And so what happens is people hear the word meek, well, the meek shall inherit the earth. And what do they think right away? Well, they think to themselves, well, meek, the meek shall inherit the earth. That means the weak shall inherit the earth. Understand this. The origin of that word meek, if we take it back far enough, and we take a look at that word trates, etc., it was used essentially to mean something like you have the ability to wield the sword, but you choose to leave it in its sheath. Isn't that an interesting thing? Meek means you have the ability to wield the sword, but you left it in its sheath. In fact, the English word meek, ironically enough, as we think of what the moderns have done with this word, one of the earliest appearances in the English language of this word meek is its appearance as a description of Lancelot. If you know anything about who Lancelot is, Lancelot was the bravest and strongest knight in the Arthurian legends. And in its earliest appearance in the English language, Lancelot is described as the meekest man on the face of the earth. Isn't that interesting? Strongest, bravest knight described as the meekest man on the face of the earth of the earth, because they said that this same guy who could pull the sword was gentle and considerate. This is a fascinating thing. This is not an anti-masculine idea. And if weakness and passivity has been your understanding, consider these commands. Be watchful. Paul, Paul, as he puts these commands together, every single one of them, he's pulling out of a context that is soldierly and that is manly. Be alert. Be on your guard against the attacks of evil. Be ready. Be aware. Be prepared for battle. He intends us to think here in terms of the sentry on guard at an army encampment. Be watchful. And then he says, stand firm in the faith. He says, don't be wishy-washy. Don't be weak. Or hesitant, but set yourself to courageously stand for what is true. 
Then he says, act like them. If you look at some of the older English translations, I kind of like the way that the older English translations say it because of the fact that it kind of resonates with me as I think of, as I think of uh, what really is being said when it says act like men. The old English was quit yourself like men. Quit yourself like men. Or acquit yourself like men. Be strong. When, when they talked about someone going into battle, if they showed courage, if they did well in battle, they would say he acquitted himself well. He acquitted himself well. And the picture is simple. In the battle for what is good, in your work to honor God, be courageous and valiant. Show us fine. Show us fine in your commitment to honor God. These are words that Christian men need to hear and take to heart. Because the fact is we're involved in a spiritual battle. There's a battle for the hearts and minds of your kids. There's a battle for the soul of your family. And there are times when I'm sure that you're very aware of it. And this is no place for the passive. This is no place for someone to sit back and be a coward. Or for someone to sit back and be lazy. Fathers and young men and boys who want to become young men, as we follow Christ, we're told to act like men. And we're told that as we do so, notice the next phrase, everything we do, every action we take, should be taken in love. Let all that you do be done in love. You see, when God's word tells us to act like men, it's not calling us to beat our chests, and it's not calling us to be macho and arrogant, and not calling us to be full of ourselves, and not calling us to be bullies. When God's word tells us to act like men, well, elsewhere, when Paul instructs husbands to love their wives like Christ, he points to the sacrifice of Christ. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And we know that Christ's sacrifice was to bring peace. And we know that in Christ's sacrifice, what he did was he didn't pull the sword from the sheath. He said, I could call an army of angels and destroy you, but I'm not going to do that. In Christ's sacrifice, it was a sacrifice to bring peace, but ultimately what it was was a strategy of war against sin and death and the one who wanted to destroy his bride. It was a sacrifice in order to obtain victory. Genesis 3 prophesied that when God says to Satan, you may bruise Jesus' heel, but he's going to crush your head. That was the prophecy. You may hurt him, but he's going to strike the death blow. And that was what the cross was. Jesus striking the death blow. So we're told to be alert and unwavering and courageous and strong as we follow Christ and act like men in loving and in love for the people around us. And this will require sacrifice. And it's likely to face opposition and maybe even mockery. But the bottom line is, don't run away and don't become passive. Act like men. As we move over on, uh, we're going to move over into 2 Timothy, and we're going to look at the passage that Steve read for us this morning, and ask you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because as we consider these words in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul is talking to, one, one older man is talking to a younger man. And as this older man, Paul, is talking to the younger man, Timothy, he begins by commanding him to entrust the teaching of the truth of Christ to others who have proved themselves faithful. And then, after he says, entrust the truth of Christ to others who will also teach faithfully, he essentially says to him, act like a man and be faithful to Christ. This is what faithfulness looks like. Act like a man and be faithful to Christ. He develops for Timothy what it looks like to be faithful. And we saw the three word pictures that he uses. 
says, share in suffering in verse 3, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him and sticks to the task. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. He talks about a soldier, purposefully committed to and devoted to obeying his commander. We think of the willingness to endure hardship to carry out mission. That's what he's saying. Show the willingness to endure hardship to carry out mission. Stick out what you're supposed to and do it. Again, I know that it's not PC to use the word soldier in the context of your description of Christianity. Because we're supposed to be soft. The Apostle Paul, speaking by the Spirit of God, has no hesitance when it comes to using the picture of a soldier. He talks about an athlete, fully committed to doing what's required of him to win the prize. And we think about the sweat and the single-mindedness and the fact of every sinew stretched toward a goal. And again, Paul uses the picture of an athlete repeatedly to speak about the Christian living out their life as a follower of Jesus Christ. He talks about a farmer, willing to stick out things when there's little to show. Through all kinds of hard work and the uncertainties of weather and the possibility of blight or pests, but committed to the task in the hope of the harvest, committed to the task as he looks ahead to the fact that all of this work that sometimes is really frustrating is worth it, as I think of the end of life, as I, is worth it as I think of why I am doing this. Now, I know there are women soldiers, and I know that there are women athletes, and I know that there are women fire, farmers. But the nature of these illustrations still makes it very clear to men that faithfulness to Christ is not easy, it's not temporary, and it's not for the faint of heart. But it's a commitment worth making, wholeheartedly, with the most worthy goal ahead. It's not just Paul that uses the athlete picture in Hebrews when we come over to the letter of Hebrew that was written in the Church of Hebrews, says there. I pray, it says, it says, uh, look to Jesus. It says, run with patience the race that's set before you, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. In Corinthians, Paul talks about competing for an olive wreath. And as he talks about that, he, said, he says, you train and you work and you push ahead for that. In, in Philippians, he says, I press toward the finish line for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Again, in Corinthians, Paul talks about a boxer, and he says, he says, if you are going to serve God, then be like a boxer. Try to make every blow count. You don't just hit the empty air. Make every blow count. You're battling for the prize. And as he uses all of these illustrations, I think to myself about this. Most men, even if we try to suppress it or hide it or are a little bit afraid of it, most of us have a competitive tendency somewhere in our homes. It may show up in different venues, but most of us have a competitive tendency somewhere in our homes. The scripture is saying here, wake it up and allow it to push you to some serious effort wherever you're exercising it in the cause of Christ. Make sure that this tendency to push, this tendency to work, this tendency to take on a challenge is something that you take and apply in the context of your Christian life. Be a man. Act like a man. We need to consider this. Do we put the same kind of effort into our greatest priority, following Christ, that we would be willing to expend in our secondary pursuits? Soldier, athletics, farming. Because they are our secondary pursuits. Our great priority is following Christ. Act like men. And with the call to act like a man as we follow Christ, there's also a call this Father's Day to act like a man as we be. Act like a man and mold lives for good. And that's what we find if we take a look over in Hebrews. And I won't be long in this, but 
Please turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 says this as we begin in verse 5. It says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? When we read these words, they're written to believers actually in that case. This letter was written to believers who were facing some struggle. And it's interesting because they were facing this struggle and they were wondering why God wasn't making their lives soft and easy. If he loves us, why isn't everything good? If he loves us, why doesn't he make everything easy? Of course, the people who were receiving this letter had also been wandering from the truth. And they'd been headed off course. And the author, inspired by the Spirit of God, says this, God is like what you know of a good father. Now, it makes sense that God is like a good father because God is the origin and designer of fatherhood. But he says, God is like a good father. And he says, then he says this, and this is what a good father does when his child is headed in the wrong direction. He's going off course and doing wrong. A good father actively chases, maybe even brings a little pain to keep that child from something far worse. Now, we're not speaking of abuse here. We're speaking of the fact that a father, truly being a father, shows the love and commitment and carefully thought through work to help a child become who they could be and who they should be. This requires some of that alertness and vigilance that we were talking about back in Corinthians. It requires some of that firmness and strength, and it requires a rooting and grounding in love. In fact, if you go on and you follow through the, the picture that's being given by the author of Hebrews here, he says that a father who isn't prepared to, to take the necessary action to mold their child for good a father who's not prepared to do the discipline and the chastening to draw their child back to the right way is virtually saying, ah, oh, they're not really mine anyways. I'm not too concerned about where they end up. That's why he says, the only ones who don't get disciplined are the illegitimate kids. The ones who don't actually belong to him, he's not too concerned. That's, that's who he wouldn't be concerned about. That's who he wouldn't chase. That's who he would draw back. If you're a dad who loves your kids, you know and feel the exact opposite. You know and feel the exact opposite. You're prepared to take the steps necessary, sometimes even strong steps, sometimes even painful steps, to mold the character of and help your child become who they should be and who they could be. This means you better have a very good idea of who you are, your own weaknesses, and your own flaws. Because chances are, you've passed some of those on. We need to be aware of our own weaknesses and our own flaws. Because if we want to help them undo them, we better understand within ourselves. And this means that you better have a very good understanding of who your children are, of their part, of their struggles, of where tenderness is going to help their development, and of where toughness will be necessary to their development. That's why we say be alert, be vigilant, in love, be on guard. Now we could take a lot of time talking about this one, but time is limited, and I will say this. 
If you aren't actively involved in the task of fathering, if you're too young or you're too old, please know this, you're not off the hook. You're not off the hook. Acting like a man, acting like a man, is still seeking to influence those around you toward good ends and in many spheres. If you are someone who basically dismisses those around you who you might influence or you might lead, then you are missing the principle here. We are called to be people who influence toward good those who are in our spheres. And as we come to the end of thinking a little bit about what it means to act like a man on Father's Day, I want to read one more thing for you. I want you to listen to what another writer who is speaking about God uh, and how God is like a good father uh, says about him. And this helps us understand more, again, of what it means to be good fathers and good men. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, we read verse 13 and 14. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. Acting like a man also means knowing how to be forgiving, how to be compassionate, how to, and understanding the frailties of others. Because you see, biblical masculinity is not a cardboard cutout. It's not flat and two-dimensional. Biblical masculinity is not a caricature. It's not over-inflating certain qualities and being someone who lacks in others. Biblical masculinity is not the weak sauce that some are trying to peddle today, that's working hard to extract the manliness from men. Biblical masculinity is a fully formed balance and tension of a whole bunch of things. It's strength and tenderness. It's vigilance driven by love. It's courage that is compassionate. It's being strong enough to follow and caring enough to lead. It's a whole bunch of things. Sometimes it means being forceful. Sometimes it means exercising patience and intentionally holding back. But in a proactive way. Not because you're lazy, but for good, because you need to allow someone to work something through. But biblical masculinity is an ideal worth pursuing. No matter how frequently, we will fall short. And it is rooted in the character of our Savior, Jesus. But boy, if it's ever been necessary, it's necessary today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you as we look into your truth. We see the one who is truth. We see Jesus Christ. And we see Jesus Christ who chose to come as a man. And in the fullness of his humanity and in the fullness of his manhood, he demonstrated to us what it means to be someone who acts like a man. I pray that you would help us to be men who are aware of and grateful for the gift of masculinity. And as we're aware of and grateful for this gift, may we thoughtfully pursue what it means to act like men in relation to our families, in relation to you, and in 